want to ask you another question around sort of the importance of the pulsatile and first insulin responses in this story of type 2 diabetes. Sure. Could you unpack that a little bit for listeners? Yes. So, so insulin secretion is is quite hard to explain because it could mean any anything. I mean, basically, you're saying the insulin that's released postprandially. Um, but what's really important, seemingly for normal physiology, is something we call the first phase insulin secretion. Um, it can basically be defined as the amount of insulin that is secreted in the first 10 minutes following a rise in blood glucose. So basically, normally, let, let's say when you eat, your pancreas, if it's healthy, is very efficient at detecting any change in blood glucose concentration. So the moment your pancreas is able to detect that your blood glucose has gone up, even 0.3 millimoles per liter, you get this really um, powerful insulin spike. And it's where your insulin goes up really fast, really high um, in the first 10 minutes. And that's called the first phase insulin response. Um, so often people use insulin spike in a negative sense, um, like, oh, you shouldn't eat carbs because it will cause an insulin spike. And this is a really this is a misunderstanding of physiology, because having a, an insulin spike that goes up and then comes down very quickly um, is a very effective way of managing postprandial glucose concentrations, because the moment your insulin goes up, it shuts down hepatic glucose output. So your liver no longer releases glucose, which it does in the fasting state. It also um, causes glucose to be um, taken up into the muscles very quickly and very efficiently. Um, it stops lipolysis. So if you're healthy and insulin sensitive, having a, a marked insulin peak is very important for controlling postprandial glucose um, and postprandial fat metabolism. What happens early on in type 2, we see this in prediabetes, the first phase insulin response is basically halved. So yes, you get a response, but it's not this peak that you'd see in healthy people. Um, and by late stage type 2, this differs between people, but it might be 10 years after diagnosis, there's barely a blip. So if you try to measure the first phase insulin response, you can barely see a blip. Um, and let me just reiterate the way we measure this is very difficult to measure, which is why we previously haven't known so much about it, is that you can really only get a picture of how well the beta cells are working by either using um, an intravenous glucose tolerance test. So this is like an oral glucose tolerance test, but you inject the glucose into a vein um, or a hyperglycemic clamp. Um, and this, I mean, on average, they can be three whole three, four hundred pounds um, in the UK per clamp, um, all in. Um, so they're very difficult to do. They're quite time consuming um, and they're expensive, but they do tell us important things about beta cell function. Um, so that's first phase insulin. Um, and then I think you mentioned pulsatile insulin release. Yep. Um, so this actually is even less studied than the first phase insulin response. Um, and so pulsatile insulin secretion basically refers to how insulin in the healthy uh, physiological state is released in a pulsatile fashion. Um, so it looks like the pulses might be five to seven minutes apart. Um, and basically, it's just insulin going up and going down and going up and going down. Um, and this is quite normal in endocrinology. So a lot of the hypothalamic hormones do have a similar pulsatile insulin secretion. Um, but its importance is very clear in, or well, we know that from studies where um, researchers have infused insulin into a vein in a pulsatile fashion, and then they've infused insulin into a vein, the same concentration of insulin, but flat. So removing the, the peaks and troughs. Mm -hmm. And what those data showed is that if you infuse insulin flat, you basically cause insulin resistance, certainly in the liver. Interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, whereas if you you infuse the same concentration in the pulsatile fashion, it reduces the insulin resistance. Um, the, the, the physiology behind how, it's pretty incredible, how the pancreas itself secretes insulin in this pulsatile fashion isn't fully understood, but you can even see it in isolated islet cells. So if you take out the islets and you look at them um, in vitro, you know, kind of on the bench, mm -hmm. you can see this almost intrinsic pulsatile secretion. Um, so it's pretty fascinating. Incredible. We don't know, yeah, don't, don't know too much about how it goes wrong, but certainly that seems to be a, a defect early in type two. Um, and in fact, you can detect a loss of pulsatile insulin secretion in 
normal glycemic relatives of people with type 2 diabetes. So someone who's got totally normal glucose, but just has a mum or dad with type 2, you already see this loss in the pulsatile insulin uh, secretion. That's fascinating. Yeah. Um, and, and Nicola, where's the potential application here with technology, the use of continuous glucose monitoring systems, um, especially as a proxy for insulin output? Um, oh, what, are, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? And where, where? Yeah, this is tough. I mean, I love CGMs. CGMs have really changed, certainly the way I manage a lot of my patients. Um, but unfortunately, insulin is so important, whether it's insulin or C-peptide. Um, so C-peptide is basically, it's released at the same time of it as insulin, but it's not taken up by the tissues in the same way. So C-peptide can be a useful marker for insulin secretion. Unfortunately, there are no ways yet of measuring insulin and C-peptide um, easily and outside of a lab. Um, that will change the game. If someone can figure out a way to measure insulin or C-peptide, the way we measure glucose, that will ch change the landscape. Um, I mean, I, re I really genuinely hope there are teams working on this because um, it's such an important question. Um, so in, in terms of the certainly CGM. I like CGMs because I think they demonstrate the effect of foods on, on blood glucose levels. Um, I think it empowers patients to see that. And I think it helps them, them manage their either pre-diabetes or type 2 diabetes that way. Um, but I would like to patients to be able to do that with insulin too. Um, but maybe I think that's probably 10 years away. Yeah, that would be definitely an incredible breakthrough. And as you mentioned, I think CGMs are terrific a learning tool for patients just to, for them to really put their finger on well, what's happening in, in, in the blood in reaction to different foods. And I think for a lot of folks, it's a pretty big eye opener to see some of these responses to things that they, you know, maybe it may have taken for granted or hadn't realized. And so definitely, um, a, a very useful tool. But if we, if we come back to this idea of food environment, which is obviously massively important, um, you mentioned the weight loss success of folks is not very good you know, regain within five years, almost across the board. All of these protocols, when we start to see this ability to get into a caloric deficit to help with weight loss, we know we can do it. We just can't help clients and patients maintain it. Um, so are we just, you know, is it, is it doom and gloom here? Are we stuck with this food environment? How can we start to shift uh, things to help folks out? Sure. I mean, so so let me just reiterate in terms of, of losing weight and weight regain. I mean, yes, the food environment is huge and we'll just come to that in just a sec. But it is important to illustrate we, we now know a lot about physiology, um, in particular ap appetite hormones. And there's clear data that when you lose weight, all of the hormones that make you want to eat increase. For sure. Um, and, and those effects seem to be maintained certainly up to a year after you lose weight. So I think it's important to let people know when they feel hungry and when they're just craving for food after they lose weight, that is, is a kind of a normal physiological response. And that's one of the reasons why it makes sustained weight loss maintenance so challenging. Um, but certainly, certainly the food environment is huge. <clears throat> and like when I talk to my colleagues about, I mean, I think the diabetes prevention program we have here is terrific. But, you know, imagine if you just attended a, an hour long session, you're really excited, you've lost some weight, um, and you walk down the high street after the session and there are seven or eight different places where food smells are wafting out, um, uh, advertising lots of cheap palatable food for, um, you know, one pound 50, you can eat your dinner, you don't need to prepare it. You know, human beings are human beings. We work long hours, we're tired, we don't have much time. Stress levels are high. Stress <laughs> levels are high, sure, and we're easily tempted. Um <clears throat> And in that kind of situation, all of the education in the world, um, unfortunately, isn't going to change our um, our natural human responses to the environment around us. Um, but I, I do have some optimism, and we've we've seen the sugar tax. Um, I mean, that was kind of a no-brainer in the sense that no one needs sugar; uh, it doesn't have any nutrients. Um, it's pretty terrible for kids, especially when it's in uh, liquid uh, drinks. You know, some kids in the States are having 25% of their calories from Coke. Yeah, um, so shocking, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. So, so I, like, I'm really pleased to see that. Um, and I think there is a growing public understanding that in some ways we've been duped by food manufacturers. Um, you know, advertising foods as healthy, Um and, and quite cynically using health claims to market their products. I think there's growing understanding that 
we have to be as consumers more cynical about our foodscape. Um, but the, the real thing is is going to be further um, political changes. I mean, so, so Darius Mozafarian um, at Tufts has some terrific ideas on this. Um, I mean, quite clearly to change food intake, um, you need point of sale, either taxation or incentives. So, for example, where researchers have lowered the prices of fruit and vegetables in a canteen, you can immediately see people start consuming more of those products. If they then increase the price of fruit and vegetables, people consume fruit, fewer of those products. So certainly pricing is going to influence food intake. Um, and I, what I would like to see, and it's a political question, um, and it's, that's not my role, but I, I think this was the kind of thing that would work, is that when you go to a food outlet, stuff like chips or fries are, let's say, $3 or $4.00 whereas the vegetables or the oily fish is heavily subsidized. Um, now, I'm not experienced in this area at all, but like I say, Professor Mozafarian, I think, has some very realistic ideas, um, some very implementable ideas, and it's going to be a case of changing, unfortunately, the law. Um, and this is going to take a lot of, of public pressure too. Um, the public have to be in on this. Um, obviously, the politicians, um, is, we certainly have this in the UK, um, they, they work with, and I think they, in certain certain circumstances, they should they should work with food industry, um, but food industry is certainly way too powerful. Um, they have we've seen with the sugar tax how much the beverage industry is fighting the sugar tax because guess what they know that it's going to reduce their their sales, um, and so the politicians, frankly, we're not going to get policy changes or legislative changes unless there is public pressure behind um, these decisions. Um, but, but certainly changing the foodscape by sensible taxation um, would be a, a useful strategy, in my opinion.